Well, thank you. I wanted to start this 18 minutes with a question. So, what do you think computer science is just fundamentally? What do we do? Well, honestly, my hint is kind of the answer behind this. I feel like computer science is all about problem solving. We love to come up with a set of instructions or an algorithm or a series of steps to kind of solve problems or maybe even achieve some sort of objective. Now, you may say, well, isn't it all about computer programming and computers? And I would say, yeah, it's definitely involved, but it's really not the main thing kind of in some ways. So computer programming to me is just a way of expressing that algorithm, that series of steps, and computers are just the context that we tend to work in. What type of problems am I talking about? Well, if you're a computer scientist, trust me, you've got a lot of problems to pick from. And the ones that I like to choose are those are in computer security, so cybersecurity. And these are three applications I'd say that everyone kind of deals with on a daily basis, but they all have security risks associated with them. So for example, Gmail or your favorite webmail application, Google Docs and things of the sort, just think of the type of information that you end up putting there, right? You've got information about your work, your business, your school, maybe even healthcare, taxes and things of the sort. And all this information is actually being held back by a password. Now there's some things you can do to kind of improve that security, but it's on you to kind of go through and configure things appropriately. Or Facebook, right? The application that allows us to tell the world what we did last night, but honestly, we may not need to tell the entire world what we did last night. And Facebook does provide us with that kind of control to kind of tell which group should see what things and what not. But again, it's really on us to kind of configure things appropriately. And even if we do, we may still leak information. And then banking, right? We do more online banking than we ever have in the past, and I think that's going to continue in the future. It's just too convenient, and it's way too efficient for the bank to go any other way. But if you think about that type of information, again, being held back by a password and maybe a PIN number, well, something else to kind of consider is the fact that we're slowly integrating these things together, right? My Facebook page knows about my Gmail address, and my bank uses Gmail for me to convey information back and forth. Right? And as an attacker, this may be yet another avenue. So instead of me breaking into all three, maybe I just pick the weakest one, break into that, and I get all two. Well, I think integration is indeed the future, right? Integration of these services to provide more complex things that are amazing. I think there's a lot of good there, but I think there's some risks that we need to be aware of. And as an example, believe it or not, I like to look at a car. <laughs> There are plenty of sensors and computers in the modern car, like 2,000. It's, it's really incredible. And individually, they're really kind of amazing. But when we pull them together, we get something that's really incredible, in my opinion. So if you take, for example, the analog brakes that have been out since the 1980s, but if we combine that with road sensors and collision sensors, now we've got a way to actually avoid accidents, which is really kind of cool. And nowadays, we've got Wi-Fi that's always active on our cars to download and upload information. Uh, you can get travel information from other cars as they pass by. You can actually do software updates and downloads from other cars in the future. And all this stuff is actually pretty amazing. But as you can imagine, as we start to kind of integrate all these things together, they get really complex. And maybe there's avenues of attack that we haven't seen before. And actually, this past summer, there was such an attack, or it was demonstrated, that you could actually connect from anywhere in the internet to a car, if it was indeed on the Wi-Fi or in the internet, break into the multimedia information unit that was poorly configured, jump to the engine's computer and then down to the brake system and actually cause that car to stop, regardless of whether or not the driver really intended it to. So these things are kind of amazing from my point of view because I enjoy studying cybersecurity, but at the same time, it's quite honestly frightening. Well, there's going to be yet more integration. As I said before, I think it is the future. And two projects to me that are really stand out are the smart grid and IoT. So the smart grid is this new power grid that's being rolled out across Europe, the United States, Asia, all over the place. And the idea is we're going to replace the current electrical grid infrastructure such that if you ever plug in something to use electrical current, right, it's going to have some additional information or technology behind it to efficiently use. So for example, think of your hot water heater can talk to your dishwasher that can talk to maybe the air conditioner. And then kind of figure things out in terms of what's the optimal use of energy at that particular point in time. And as a community, this is amazing. IoT, really hard to explain what IoT is. It's still kind of up in the air. But the way I like to think about it is a ton of sensors that can kind of work together with some computing power behind it to self-configure, to maybe understand what I'm trying to do or who I am, to maybe provide some additional services. But the weird thing about this is as these interconnections kind of grow, they're much larger and more complex than anything that we've ever seen. 
Actually, this is much larger than the internet than we know it today, and that's like me saying, let's just secure the internet. Good, good try on that one. I think the benefits are going to be great, so I'm really excited about the future, but I think there's going to be some risk associated with that as well. And the bad news is we really can't use traditional approaches as we've done in the past. And there's three reasons why I like to think this is the case. The first is this idea of optimal or bust. The traditional approaches tend to be either I can fix it or I can't. No middle ground between those. And I think with security, that's a little crazy. The model must fit idea is, well, behind the scenes, we're really mathematicians. We love to develop mathematical models, find a solution for the model, and then apply that in real life. But oftentimes, we have to make so many assumptions about the the real life problem to fit it into the model that is pretty unrealistic. And the last one is limited scale. So yeah, we can maybe fix five computers or manage five computers using this really cool technique, but if I need it to go to 50,000, I just can't scale it up. It just doesn't seem to behave. It's kind of like a skateboard when it's its normal size is pretty amazing. But if I you know, increase it a thousand times, it's not going to be a thousand times more amazing. And actually, well, honestly, it looks pretty sweet. But <laughs> In reality, it, it doesn't quite function the same way. It doesn't meet the same need, and that's what's the problem with our approaches. Well, I'm not here to give you a lot of negativity associated with the future, although I am actually an engineer in training, so if you're an engineer, you know what that joke is all about. Um, but what I can say is maybe there's solutions out there that we just haven't recognized yet. And to me, they've been around us for some time, and it's actually from nature. I feel, really feel like nature is an amazing problem solver. It deals with these complex problems on a regular basis, all the time. So ant colonies are a great example of this. They're able to find these paths from a food source to the colony and back. And if we look at them as computer scientists, they actually are pretty close to optimal, as in the shortest path that they need to take. Furthermore, this is done without any sort of centralized control. Ants don't have one big ant telling all other ants what to do. These are individual decisions. They can influence each other through pheromone and things of the sort, but honestly, it's an ant making their own call. But somehow, from local decisions, a global optimum is achieved. So again, from a computer science standpoint, this is really cool. They're able to adapt to different situations. They can cross water. I didn't know that until I found this picture. That's pretty frightening to me. But they can also mine air gaps as well, right? They can build bridges. Well, that's great too, I guess, I suspect. As a computer scientist, this is amazing. I guess as a homeowner, I'm quite alarmed at this point. Um, but they're also very scalable, right? So they send the right number of ants to kind of uh, interact with a food source or maybe even a threat. They don't go more or less, right? It's always the right amount. So efficiency is something they're always mindful of as well. Well, this is just one example of an algorithm, uh, how the human brain works and actually processes information, how tree roots are able to grow around obstacles efficiently. How fireflies in North Carolina are able to blink in unison is actually very attractive to power grid managers. Uh, how chameleons manage their camouflage for defense. We could do that in cyber, as well as bee defense, right? The swarm. You'd never want to punch this guy in the face, by the way. Uh, are all examples of how this is actually pretty amazing. So I do believe that a nature-inspired approach is maybe the right way to go in some of these complex problems, and maybe we could call it solved in some way. Well, I can give you five good reasons. Actually, it's just four uh, good reasons why I think this is actually a pretty cool approach. The first is I like these approaches because they don't demand optimal all the time. Often, OK is good enough. Maybe that path we found to the food source isn't the best yet, but it found the food source and will improve that over time. We need this in cybersecurity, in my opinion. So 80% is fine. Just please improve it next time is the way I think about it. If the situation changes, no problem. Adapt. Natural systems adapt all the time. And in cybersecurity, to me, it's the name of the game. Attackers change. They're not static, but for some reason, we love our static defenses. Mistakes are cool, unless, of course, you're taking my test, so don't get carried away, kids. Um, but mistakes are cool. They're fine. You learn from your mistakes. So learning from your mistakes, kids, is, is the way to go, Connor, so just keep that in mind. Um, but what I'm saying here is don't be so uptight about getting hacked. You're going to get hacked. I've been hacked. Connor's been hacked. If you haven't been hacked, I'll hack you later. <laughs> it's just going to happen. What I'm really asking and what we need to do is figure out, hey, can we learn from these attacks? And best yet, we just learn from each other. And then scalability, yeah, these approaches are extremely scalable. One thing that seems to be always missing with the traditional approach, right, the ant colony is able to scale up and down dynamically. It's really kind of cool, and we need this kind of ability as well, I think. Well, there's a lot of different algorithms to choose from, and the one that we're currently using for uh, security is actually evolution. So I'm certain you're familiar with evolution and the general ideas of survival of the fittest and later generations improve upon current generations, et cetera, et cetera. 
But as a computer scientist, you look at this and say, well, this is really kind of a clever way of finding something, right? It's a search technique. Um, so we want to find the best of X, or maybe we want to develop the best of X. So let me walk you through the algorithm as we know it, uh, as computer science, to kind of find maybe the best dog. Let's assume that you're, in, you're looking for the best dog. You would assemble a population of all the dogs that we currently have, and out of those, you'd pick the best two. Right, so either one of those two dogs are really good, but probably they're not fitting the bill that you really want. So you say to yourself, well, if I can in some way combine these two dogs together and share their characteristics, maybe I can get a better dog. Well, this is where it gets a little embarrassing. I didn't want to talk about this. So let's just say, since it's a family show, we just take the dogs and we tape them together. Right, some glue, some string, and we get a new dog out of that. Um, and what's kind of amazing is it shares the characteristics of the two other dogs. We'll take one more step, which is kind of the weird one. And as a computer scientist, you kind of say, whoa, you're going to introduce randomness to this? And yeah, actually you do. It's found in nature. And we do this in this algorithm as well. So we'll go through and we just randomly change a few things about the dog. Maybe it's bad, maybe it's good, but either way, evolution in the process is going to kind of take care of it and kind of propagate it forward if it's good and not if it's bad. So what we end up with is generations that may have a lot of different characteristics, but over the generations, you hone in on the set of characteristics that were solving your problem. You may not even know what characteristics there were. It's really kind of a cool idea. In this case, it's a bunch of green Cairn Terriers, and if you own a Cairn Terrier, that's hilarious. Anyway, so given that I've given you the algorithm that I'm trying to use, let's talk a little bit about the problem that we're trying to solve, and that's configuring all your stuff. Every software application that you download, install on your phone or your PC or lap, whatever, it's got a configuration. And a lot of times you've got to go through and check all those little boxes, yes, no, yes, no, sometimes, maybe, right? And the idea is you do this in order to make sure the application works. Well, in reality, we should do this to make sure the application works and is secure. So I'd say the majority of us, and I'm included, don't actively manage these configurations. We load a new app on the phone and we just kind of move on. But these sorts of settings are everywhere. You've got them in Gmail, you've got them inside of Facebook, you've got them inside your banking app. And the one that I'm really curious about is your cell phone, right? Your smartphone has got a ton of these little check boxes if you ever switch to that particular slide. And whenever you uh, load up uh, a new application, it changes the configuration, it actually adds more things to look at. But really, when it changes it, it's really just to make it work. It doesn't really care that much about your security, in my opinion. So what we're looking at at Wake Forest is maybe we could apply evolution to this process. Let the phone be the best phone possible, right? Just let it learn on its own, as you would find a species in nature to do that. And maybe it can defend itself. How would I do this? Well, believe it or not, it's the same steps I walked you through for finding the best dog, which I suggest you do to find the best dog. No, no. Um, let's assume that we've got a population of configurations for the phones, and each one of these colored lines represents a setting. I pick out the best two. They're not fitting the bill completely, but maybe I can cross them over. Again, kind of embarrassing story, but you know when one phone likes another phone, you end up with another phone. <laughs> and that's what we do with this crossover. So we get a new configuration from that. And then we'll randomly change something about the phone, right? It's configuration setting. And we'll throw it back in the population, rinse and repeat over and over again. And what we found is over the generations, you actually end up with a much stronger phone in terms of security, or maybe even performance. It's actually kind of amazing, but it was all around us. It's been happening. Well, sadly, I can't change, let's say, President Hatch's flip phone to an iPhone. <laughs> That's a completely different type of evolution. It's from species to species, and honestly, I feel kind of uncomfortable being in a church and talking about that one. But what we can do... <laughs> Uh, is make your flip phone the best flip phone possible, or your best PC possible, or maybe even your server. So what we're really interested in at this point is actually just evolving web servers. What are web servers? These devices that sit out on the internet and provide information to your browser. Anytime you go to a website, you're interacting with a web browser, or a server, right? So they're extremely important. They have tons of information. As a result, they're very rich targets for attackers as well. They're very complex to set up. So what we do is, in our lab, we set up these servers and we give them a lot of um, insecurities, uh, vulnerabilities. It sounds like I'm talking about a person who needs to go to uh, psychotherapy, but honestly, it's just ways of hacking the machine. We just kind of put them in automatically. And if you're interested, you can go to the website and take a look at it. I think you'll really like it. Um, and then we set it and we apply evolution towards it, um, and then we attack it as an attacker would. And what's amazing is it actually does indeed get stronger. Right? It's able to learn what is the best posture for itself in order to resist this attack. And if I attack in a different way, it's able to rebound and do the same thing. 
So there's three things I really like about this, which is kind of a no-brainer if you study evolution. It was already there. Is the fact that it's able to figure this out, which is really cool, complex, hundreds of thousands of combinations. Uh, the other thing is if I change the attack, no worries. It's going to figure it out as well. It's always on. This constant adaptation is amazing, right? I stick in the flip phone in my pocket and I pull out an iPhone. No, that's not how it works. You pick out a, a better flip phone, right? It's kind of cool. And the last thing I really like is it doesn't require anything from me. It just works in the background. Occasionally I check in on it and make sure that it's evolving the way that I want. Well, kind of going back to the earlier problem that I mentioned before, interconnected systems, I really feel like this approach can kind of apply to this, this huge interconnected systems that rely upon each other. We can apply maybe evolutionary techniques to each one of these devices, and they can evolve independently, but we could do kind of co-evolution, which you find in nature, where one system can help another in some weird way, right? It can kind of just evolve to be that way. And as a result, I think we can make these complex systems safer, kind of rolling forward. Well, this is really the only slide I need to show you today, so uh, sorry about the other 17 minutes. Um, although cybersecurity, I believe, is becoming really complex and difficult, uh, it's possible that there are solutions that are very suitable out there in nature. It's just that we need to look at them in kind of a different light and just apply those strategies. Uh, this work was done by a lot of folks. I'm the fortunate one to come here and speak to you guys, which I appreciate as well. Uh, and a lot of these folks are undergraduates or former undergraduates at Wake Forest University. It started with Michael Krauss a number of years ago, and it continues on with the folks that we have listed here as well. So I thank them, and I thank you.